Hi there, this is Richard from Bookmark Games. Um, I'm looking at the new uh, game we've got coming out, Arnhem Airborne Assault. And the idea of this video is just to show you how to play it and to help you find your way around the game. Uh, this is the front screen. Uh, a couple of things to note here. We've got a help button up in the top left hand corner of the screen. If you press on that at any time, it just shows you uh, what's on the screen. It just helps you find your way around a little. Uh, there are also a set of instructions uh, here, uh, which, which with some quick links on the left, so if you're looking for anything in particular, you can very quickly find uh, information around the, uh, the combat phase, for example, uh, and how that works, uh, or how logistics works, or whatever, and, and some frequently asked questions that we've pasted here as well, just to try and help things out a little. Um, the first thing you might want to do when you uh, start the game is to set up um, an online account. Um, the settings button here allows you to do that. Uh, then if I want to create a new name, uh, maybe students perhaps, uh, and I'll need to assign a, a password to it. Uh, so let's put a password in. And finally, uh, an email address. Um, I'll invent one for the purpose of this demo. I imagine students use Hotmail or something like that, I don't know. And then press the, um, press the register button and that will go in and register the user. Now that hasn't actually connected the user to the uh, to the multiplayer yet. We just need to press the connect button to do that. It will log the user in and fingers crossed. In a second. Might still be uh, going through setting up the account. There we go. Uh, now that user's connected down at the, uh, the bottom there and can be used for multiplayer. Um, there are a bunch of other options on this screen, they're all fairly self-explanatory um, and I'll leave them as they are. If you have this connect at start, by the way, set up, it means that when you when you open the game, um, each time it will automatically go and connect your uh, your username to the, to the multiplayer system, um, so you don't have to keep going to this screen. Okay, so we're having, having done that, having connected a new user, uh, we might want to create a multiplayer game. Um, now if I try and create multiplayer with, with one player on, obviously it's not going to work, nothing happens, uh, but we might want to set up a game on, say, the Market Garden scenario, which carries up to four players. Uh, some of the other, the other scenarios don't carry quite as many, but the Market Garden one carries four players. I might want to start a two-player game. I'm going to have it online, and then press the Start button. That then allows me to enter the name of the opponent that I want to play against, and I want to choose against, uh, to play against Monty. I can set the turn time limit down here, which is between one and five days. That really means that it's the amount of time that um, each player has to take their turn. If they don't take the turn within that time limit, then play moves on to the next player. And then I press the send game button. Okay, it just goes and checks that the players can uh, can play a game. If it comes back red, then it means that that user didn't exist. If it comes back yellow, it means that the player already has too many games that they're playing and can't create a new one. But that one was successful. Having created the game, we now need to use the resume game button. Um, and if I press the online option, it goes back and finds the game, and I can start it and go from there. And we'll do the market garden drops. Right, I'm going to skip out at this point now for the uh, the demo, and we'll go back and um, and look at a new screen. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we're going to play a few turns of an example scenario now, just to have a look at how some of the game mechanics work. So I'm going to click on New Game here, and we'll pick the Nijmegen scenario. So let's choose that one. There we are. Uh, now what happens is we get some explanatory text here that just explains that we need to move the units from the uh, southeast of Nijmegen uh, up. Uh, there are a couple of ways we can use either this route here or, or this route here, uh, up to try and capture the bridge capture and hold the bridge just north of Nijmegen uh, and the just hold bit is kind of important as well it's not just uh, a case of taking the bridge we need to make sure we can hold it until uh, midday on September the 19th so let's press start and pick a save game slot and we use that one and off we go so the first thing that happens is that our units are going to be dropped uh, over near, uh, near Nijmegen just to the southeast and um, once they're done, I think they're all done, here we go. Uh, we can just move the map around and have a look. It's not a bad drop, 
it's not too bad. What you really want to hope for is that some of these um, artillery units are dropped near the road because they move much faster along the road. So just looking at some of the mechanics, if I click on a unit here, it shows me the movement that is available to that unit. I can zoom out a bit if I want to as well, just to sort of see it in a bit more detail. Units much, move much faster along roads, uh, so you want to try and get units close to roads if you can. When I click on a unit, as well as seeing where it can move to, I can also see uh, which HQ it belongs to. Uh, and that's the HQ it gets its supply from. And that's important because if I click on the logistics box here, um, I can see what the supply range is for um, for this unit. Now, obviously, if units can move faster along roads, so can supply. So you can see that supply is moving along the road here, but it won't go into the forest particularly well. Uh, and it goes this way along the road as well. Um, as well as taking supply from its owning HQ, um, this unit, you can see, belongs to the 82nd Airborne HQ, which is just over here. Let's zoom in a little. Oh, wrong way. Um, so it can also take supply uh, from, from that HQ as well, because it's the HQ's HQ, in a matter of speaking. If I click on, click on another unit, I'll see that the, um, the artillery uh, unit here belongs to this HQ. Uh, we, can, we can sort of cycle around. If I want to cycle around units as well, I can use this button here, which allows me just to see the next available unit. So I can, I can cycle around all of my available units if I want to. If I want a unit to dig in, press on the dig in button here. <clears throat> uh, if I want it to defend, then I can use the defend button here. Units can dig in and then defend, but they can't defend and then dig in. Either you're defending or you're not defending. Uh, and if they need to rest, if they get hit in battle, then um, then, then we can use the, uh, the button there, the, the sleep button, just to just to rest them up a bit. Uh, if I want to see some information on a unit, I can click on it. Um, let's click on that one and press I. Uh, and that shows me uh, information about the attack and defense strength, how much movement the unit has available, supply, health, and morale, uh, what its attack range is. I can also see uh, a lot of the terrain modifiers um, and I can see um, that this unit, for example, attacks well in woodland. Uh, all infantry units do attack in woodland, um, and um, but they're not so good if they're caught on a ferry, um, like a lot of units, really. In addition, units get attack and defense modifiers against certain other unit types, um, and, um, and the infantry unit gets a plus two attack against an HQ unit. If I click on an, on an HQ unit, for example, I can see a similar sort of screen and uh, and HQ units actually don't get as many uh, positive modifiers, they get more uh, sort of defensive uh, penalties. Also I can see um, the amount of movement points that the unit has left here uh, next to the unit icon on the right hand side, uh, and how much supply it has, what its morale looks like and what its attack range is. If I look at some of the uh, artillery units, I can see they've got an attack range of two or four. When you uh, when you take a turn with your unit, if you move, order a unit to move, and we'll order this one to move up the road, then it uses up a number of command points. Uh, each turn I've got a number of command points based on the number of HQs I have, have available, plus a base level. So if, uh, if I lose an HQ, it restricts my ability to order my units around the battlefield. If I want to see how the scenario is set up, I can just click on this button here and I can see that we need to uh, achieve 1300 points by, uh, by the 9th of September. <clears throat> I can see where those objectives are. I can see that the um, Allied allies hold this objective here. If I go look at the, uh, the bridge at Nijmegen, I can see that uh, the Axis holds this one because it's in red. What I can't see is where any of the Axis units are at the moment. I'm not close enough to them to find them. Finally, if I, uh, if I can't remember how to play the game, I can click on the Instructions button here, and I can have a look through the instructions if there's anything in particular that I wanted to look up around, uh, around the combat phase. Maybe I want to look at what the adjustments are. Here I can see that dug-in units and defending units get different bonuses, but also units that have already been attacked this turn and units that have been under an artillery attack this turn suffer some penalties as well, a few, a few other penalties. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take the turn now. If I, so having selected the unit here, I then click on the hex that I want it to move to. 
There we go. Um, if I click on a hex, I can see the type of terrain over here on the right hand side. So I can see what sort of hexes we've got Woodson Road uh, on any one hex. So if I click on the town here, I can see it's a town. Let's move some of these up the road. And <clears throat> when, um, when artillery units are in fields, they do move very slowly, but once they get onto a road, they start moving a bit faster. We're going to look at the, um, it's got two movement units, it's got two movement left, and it takes two movements to move through a field. Which is why you want them nice and close to the road at the start of the scenario if you can. We've got two command points left, so let's just move some more infantry units. Okay, and having finished my movement phase, um, a game of Arnhem Airborne Assault takes place over four phases. The first phase is the deployment phase, uh, where we saw units dropping earlier on. The second phase is this phase, the movement phase. The third phase is a combat phase, um, but since we don't have any units in combat, that won't take place this turn. And the fourth and final phase is a logistic phase, where units are resupplied where they require supply based on the uh, supply line. So this unit, I think we found that was still in supply, didn't we? Yep. Once I've finished looking at uh, the movement phase, I just click on the next phase button, which is here. And that shows me the logistics screen. Uh, and this screen shows me the, all of the units that I have in play. Uh, and it's ordered by a sort of a divisional hierarchy. Uh, it shows me the strength uh, and health, and supply and morale of the units. Any changes are shown here as well. Units that haven't dropped yet, we've shown their drop date. We don't see the drop time because we don't know when that is. And I can just page through the uh, the report just to see for each uh, HQ what its associated units are and how they're doing. So now that we've taken our turn, it's time for the, uh, the computer to take a turn. So press the OK button and I'll go around and move uh, its, its units. And there we go, and it's back to uh, back to us again. So we're going to carry on moving these units up to the road. Let's move this one north, hopefully. Yeah, we can see a unit now. Um, so this is the first one we can see. Uh, visibility in towns is a little restricted, uh, so we can't see too far away. The interesting thing, though, is that uh, this unit's currently in uh, woods. It can see out of the woods, so it can see units um, that, are, that are in the town. But any units that were in the town or wouldn't be able to see this unit here hidden in the woods. So you do get uh, an awful lot of cover in woods, which is very good if you're trying to hide units from uh, from, from the enemy. <clears throat> the bad side of that is that the, um, the enemy unit does get a lot of defensive bonuses uh, in town due to the hard cover that's available there. So it might be quite difficult to, uh, to knock that unit out. But I think we're going to have to go through it if, uh, if we're going to get anywhere in the scenario. That's why we're bringing the guns forward. Okay, so again, computer takes its turn. Let's... Okay, so now we've got a supply drop, uh, which has just turned up with five supply points. Uh, supply is a useful commodity. Um, it helps your units attack uh, and dig in as well. If I want to pick up the supply, I just need to move a unit on top of it, uh, and it'll collect it. If, uh, if this unit here was to pick it up, this um, engineer unit, it would then distribute the supply directly to its owning HQ um, because units themselves don't, uh, don't collect supply. Uh, and in this case, that's the 82nd Airborne HQ would collect the supply. So it's worth um, bearing in mind where you need your supply most when you see supply drops. Right, we can move in now to, uh, to attack this uh, unit. What we see there is that we've also got um, another infantry unit that's guarding the entrance to the bridge. Um, now the uh, the um, anti-tank unit that can attack infantry as well. Um, it gets particular bonuses against tanks, obviously, uh, as it says in the name. Um, it attacks over a range of two, so we don't want to get it too close to any of the um, enemy units. I think the best place. We'll, we'll move it here and see what happens. And there's more here than I was hoping for, but there we go. Um, and then we'll just move these ones further up. There we go. And last but definitely not least, this artillery unit just needs to move up as well. And when you're attacking, you really want to try and get your units to work in combinations. Um, because, uh, as we saw earlier, 
defensive units suffer penalties if they're attacked by more than one unit, and they also suffer penalties if they're attacked by um, artillery. So what we'll do now is we'll, we'll go on to the combat phase, because we've got combat this time, we do the combat phase. Uh, you get a number of assault points, which is also dependent on the number of available HQs uh, that you have. So the first one we're going to attack with is the anti-tank unit. We can choose to attack either of these uh, two units that are in range. And I'm going to attack the NCO school. Now this is the combat screen. It shows me my strength um, and supply and all of the sort of things that factor towards the uh, attacking strength. And equally, we see a number of the defending um, values. This, this bar here shows us the probability that our attack will be a success. Um, and the green stretch is the, uh, the likelihood. So it's a, it's a, it's a small probability, um, but we don't mind at the moment. It's a, um, it's a ranged unit, so it can't be attacked back. Um, and also, it'll provide us with modifiers for our subsequent attacks. So let's just work through these by clicking the attack button. Um, I get a couple of options here. I can either attack the, um, the, 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 the infantry unit. I can assault the infantry unit, which will use two supply points. Um, but it will also do double damage. Uh, I can withdraw from the attack. And if I withdraw uh, in the first turn, then it's a free withdrawal. I can just have a quick look to see what the enemy's strength and the likelihood is like. But if I withdraw in phases two or three, and each combat is over three phases, then... Um, then the enemy gets a free hit, or a free attempt at hitting me anyway. What I can do instead is I can retreat, uh, which is sort of like a fighting retreat. Retreating uses one supply point, but it means that I won't be attacked by the enemy. Okay, I'm going to attack on the last phase here. Okay, so I didn't score any hits. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of um, defensive bonuses in the terrain that the, that the uh, unit gets here. So let's end the combat. However, having done that, we'll find now that our, um, our infantry attacking gets a, a modifier. Um, so, so their likelihood uh, is a little better. So let's attack. And unfortunately it took a hit there, which is bad luck. But it's fighting back again. And that's the end of that combat phase. So again, three phases. And finally, we'll attack with this one. So this time, uh, we've had an artillery attack, and we're also, we've also had another unit attack, so the, the, the cumulative modifier is now up to minus 30%. So we've got a better chance of, uh, of scoring a hit and uh, taking a hit back instead. So obviously this NCO unit is, uh, is fighting hard. We'll use an assault on the last turn, but unfortunately it wasn't successful either. So not the most successful attacking phase that I've uh, ever had. Having finished the combat, we're going to go through our turns. The computer will take its movement turn um, and now take its attacks. And it's attacking with its flak units. And also, it looks like that infantry unit that was on the bridge has moved forward to attack my anti-tank unit. And we're really suffering under, under attack here at the moment. So we're going to have to move. Yeah, it moved off the bridge. Um, so we're going to have to move things around. Right, it's night time now. Uh, it's 8 o'clock in Nijmegen. Now, nighttime has a couple of different uh, impacts on the way the game plays. Firstly, we get fewer command points at nighttime, so I can't move as many units. Um, secondly, visibility isn't as good at nighttime, so I can no longer see that flak unit that was just north of the bridge. Um, I can only see um, a couple of hexes away at nighttime, depending on the terrain. It's sort of halved, visibility is halved at nighttime. So in the town, I'm only really going to see units that are right next to the units that uh, I've got there in the game. It's very handy if you're trying to slip some units through uh, through enemy lines at night time, especially reconnaissance units. Um, and thirdly, uh, during night time, attacking is less likely to be successful. Uh, so it's, um, you might want to save your save your supply, especially if you're low on supply. You might not want to use them on night time attacks. Uh, we can see, obviously, this unit, having having been attacking, uh, used one one supply point for combat plus two supply points for the um, for the assault attempt that it uh, it made as well. Because we're outside of the HQ range, they weren't resupplied overnight either. So what we're going to do is we're just going to get this unit out of um, out of the firing line, get it down towards its HQ, and hopefully we'll find it's actually in range of supply, just in range of supply there. So it'll um, be resupplied on the next turn. Obviously, units can only be supplied by HQs if the HQ's got some supply itself. Uh, and that's, again, something that you need to watch. Uh, allied, H allied 
units particularly are in danger of running out of supplies, uh, a lot of Axis HQs get um, an infinite amount of supply. Uh, right, we'll move this one in for attacking. Move on to the next phase. And again, we're going to use the um, anti-tank unit to attack. Now, if the anti-tank unit were to attack this infantry unit, then the infantry unit could fight back. But instead, we're going to use the anti-tank unit to attack this one again. Again, not very successful. Clearly, they, um, they need to do some target practice. We'll go and attack this one. Again, we've got some modifiers here which help, and that's starting to... Uh, and as this unit gets weaker, um, the probability that the attack will be successful uh, grows as well. Uh, and we're getting there with it. Hitting there. Um, it's worth noting that because we get fewer command points at night, we also get fewer assault points. Uh, if you were to play a, a larger scenario that involved more HQs, then you'd get more assault points. But in this small scenario, we don't get so many. Okay, hopefully, with uh, modifiers of minus 30 and only one health left, we'll uh, <laughs> fighting back. Definitely hanging on. There we go. Um, so we've been victorious. Now we can either hold our ground um, or we can advance into the hex here. It sort of depends, really. I think, I think this time we'll hold ground only because we want to force the computer to move. Um, we don't really want to sort of open ourselves to attack. Having said that, of course, it might be useful for defending that anti-tank gun that's under attack from the um, infantry unit, but we'll hold for the time being. Um, okay, again, I can tab around here, but there aren't any more units that need to attack, so there's nothing more to see. We'll play on the next turn. Now we're under artillery fire. So although we can't see this artillery unit, um, the infantry unit that was in Nijmegen can see us and can therefore direct the artillery unit. So it might seem a little unfair, but that's, uh, that's the way it works. Uh, you can sort of use units as spotters. So even, even some weak units, especially at night time, can be quite useful just for spotting enemy units and helping direct your artillery fire. Uh, Anti-tank units coming under a lot of assault. OK, um, the last thing I just want to look at is um, resting. Now we have this unit here. Uh, as you can see, it was seven supply before. It's now picked up one supply overnight. We can, um, we can rest it. Now I only have at night time, I only have two command points in this scenario. Um, during the day, if I want to rest a unit, that costs me one supply point, but I can actually rest units free of charge overnight. So I press on the, the sleep button now, that unit goes into rest, and um, it hasn't used a supply point, it'll be resupplied by this HQ as long as this HQ stays in its supply range. I'm going to also uh, maybe we'll, we'll dig in this um, anti-tank unit. Normally I wouldn't, but I just want to show you that we can dig in or we can defend. The important difference um, is that if I dig in, this unit can still attack. It's dug in, but it's attacking. If I defend with this unit, it can't attack on this turn or on any turn that it's defending. So it's useful. defending is useful if you just want to kind of hold, um, hold a point. It's like an active defense, but they won't actively attack any, uh, any units. I think, in fact, what I'm going to do is just get it out of the way, really, because otherwise it's going to get uh, get destroyed. So we'll just bring it back into the woods here. Okay, now having moved it, we can't see that um, that unit in the dark any longer, the infantry unit. So um, although, you know, if it's daylight, we'd be able to see it quite clearly, but now at night time, we can't see it very well in the, in the dark in the town. Um, and again, we can cycle around. And take the end of the turn. Now we'll see what the uh, computer does if that infantry unit goes looking. No, it didn't. So it can't see us either. Uh, so it does work both ways. Right. At that point, I'm going to stop playing this scenario. Uh, if you'd like to see what happens, then you're very welcome to buy Arnhem Allied Assault. It's on the iTunes Store and on the Google Play Store. Uh, if not now, then very soon. Thank you very much for, um, for listening and watching. I hope it's been a useful... Uh, an informative guide to uh, some of the uh, different rules that govern Arnhem Airborne Assault um, and I hope you have a lot of fun playing it. Thank you very much.